today we're talking about compensation, or as the title of this talk is called, Making Money Moves. So I'd love to uh, start off with the question of, you know, in the industry, working at different firms, like what's the what's the salary trajectory has been? I think we can kind of also talk about interesting opportunities in our conversation about like a hacking salary in a sense. So uh, Joanne, maybe we can start off with you. Like what's that been like for you? Um, actually, it was not bad, I guess, in the architecture term <laughs> compared to most architects. I, I think... Um, my salary trajectory for the past 10 years has not been too bad. It definitely started really low when I first, like my first year, I believe I was offered like $34,000 as a starting salary, which at the time it was 2011. And the, the problem was it was, after the recession and no one was hiring. So I had to kind of just take whatever job was given to me as I tried really, really hard to interview with so many firms and no one was, um, like firms would interview me and just tell me we're not actually hiring. We're just, you know, keeping the interviews to see if anyone is interesting, maybe down the line when we're hiring at least we have a backlog of candidates. Um, so that was a very hard time to find a job. And I, I think there's this also um, this kind of perception that when you have a lower starting salary, especially during the recession, it becomes really hard because all your future salary is kind of based on your first um salary to start with so we had a discussion actually a few years ago with someone uh, with some of my coworkers that like people that started in a recession usually get like lower paid throughout their entire experience um, which kind of sucks and I think we can also talk about that too is how do you overcome that down the line Um, I graduated uh, in the recession, so I was in grad school at that time. So luckily, I, did, I wasn't looking for a job at the same time. And I think most people left um, architecture at that time because they were just they were even, they're losing their jobs or not being able to get new jobs. So luckily, like the economy was coming back then. And I also went into a small firm with like, I think small firms or maybe like if you're more lucky, you'll get benefits included, all of those other things. But like I started a job as like a 1099 consultant, like no benefits, you know, paid everything out of pocket, like after, um, you know, like taxes too. And that was really hard in the beginning, but I also had the mindset where, you know, any job, any foot in the door is better than none, right? So I, I think it's like personally, like what you have, like the capacity to work with because some people can't take low paying jobs where like, you're like almost paying out money to survive, right? Like not everyone has that ability. So that was hard. And I un I also believe that like, you do have to kind of fight for your pace because it does impact down the line. But I would like to say that the recession didn't hurt me in that way because I found that I was able to kind of like recoup that um, low pay in, later on by moving to a larger firm. Um, that ha just had like everything taken care of in terms of like benefits for the employees and then also make up that pay gap that I was experiencing um, in my former place. What about you, George? I'm flashbacking. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as you're talking, I'm trying to go back deep. I don't remember. I mean, my first, my first job, like official, at least in architecture, aside from doing like consulting here and there was like um, more like a paid internship. Um, and it was pretty good. I remember that I, there was overtime pay involved, but I somewhat naively, I didn't understand the mechanism for overtime pay for interns. Cause you know, there's a salary, you're not a salary employee. You're an hourly employee. Um, at that time I was 
on hourly. So there was an overtime component to it. And I might have misused that overtime uh, a bit here and there, just naively thinking that going over 20 hours was considered overtime. But um, aside from, from that, I, you know, most of what I, most of my, the salary when I got out of school started when I joined a startup. Um, and so my salary trajectory started about the same time that we were fundraising for a startup that I was a part of, the third, the third team member. And uh, at that point, I started around 50K, which was about the same as like what I had at Columbia uh, when, I, when I got hired to run their accreditation. Um, and looking back on that, it was interesting that, this, that the school was, itself was paying more than a lot of the students were making coming out of school for one. Also the world of benefits is something that it's not really talked about as much as when you think about your over your overall comp plan and how important it is to have like 100% healthcare, healthcare coverage if possible, um, how important it is um, to get, you know, when you think about what well, there's a 401k plan. And I think just in the entire world of like the personal, like the personal finance area of how you make decisions um, is really important and very little discussed in architecture. Um, and since then, it's kind of fluctuated. I've had moments where I had to go into full consulting route, and that's kind of been on back on hourly. Um, but in technology, it's just a very different world too because of the the operating, the underlying business model, and the need for certain types of talent just have a different impact on salary outcomes. And then you have equity on top of that, which is another very uh, poorly understood mechanism for being able to think about your overall compensation. Um, it's more of a bet that you're taking on the company in some sense to lower your salary in, in terms of getting more equity potentially and things like that. But um, I think bringing it back to the field of architecture, um, I have noticed over the years through many friends um, of various hacks that they were able to use to improve their their situation. One of which is just the idea that, you know, a lot of firms operate under a kind of like 5% salary bump model um, or maybe lower, right? Uh, on an annual basis. Moving to another, another company is always an opportunity that you have available to you in which you can reset your base salary. And I remember talking to a good friend that was working at uh, Norman Foster I think before that he was kind of applying to different places. And this is the kind of hack that he told me is like, well, basically the only way to kind of improve your salary situation is to leave ship every two to three years. Um, and it's unfortunate that that has to be the case sometimes, especially in companies that aren't scaling quickly enough to kind of meet, um, you know, potentially allow you to grow into different roles. Um, the other avenue is always to kind of start your own thing. You know, your, your W-2 is just one way to generate sort of income and there's other opportunities to include you know side hustles and things like that as part of a way to think about your total economic situation but anyway i'm curious what others think here um and if anyone please uh, feel free to you know add, add questions or or raise your hand and we can bring you on board to kind of discuss your own your own thoughts on the matter um, I also would like to add, since you both shared, because like, <clears throat> sorry, compensation is such a taboo topic. And like, I've developed relationships with my coworkers over the years that I felt comfortable enough to share salary, but it's always like such a weird way. Like, it's like, oh, like, I don't know if it's okay to ask, but I like, um, but I actually, from my experiences, I, I would love to share, like, as be like as honest about these conversations as possible, because it's so much easier to have like a clear conversation when you're, when you're like, um, when you're just at that level. So I think I started like barely, like maybe 30,000, like Joanne said, <clears throat> after four years, like, <clears throat> sorry, uh, after four year, five years, it was like 40,000 barely. And then like when I jumped ship to a bigger company, it was 60,000. So yeah, like I was just like, I was making this much bef like before and like all I had to do was find a better job. So yeah, um, but let's go to hacks now. <laughs> Yeah, I'm curious, Joanne, because I know that you talked to a lot of different people too within the Women Architects Collective and 
other communities. Um, what's what's been your sort of sentiment? And I know we can maybe talk even a little bit about the recent. Uh, I don't know. On Twitter, at least, there's been a lot of conversations around this topic. But yeah, I'm curious what you've seen. Um, I think it all comes down to like asking for a raise. I know that I mean the same. The biggest jump you can get in your salary is to switch job, as you said. <laughs> but if you don't want to leave your firm, you really should ask for a raise more often. I think, like you said, firms operate in kind of like a raise to just basically match inflation, um, which this year has been crazy. <laughs> but it's kind of like if you are if you're taking on more and more responsibility over the years, I think it's just important to have those conversations to ask for a raise that is really matching what you're doing. But at, at the same time, like Sylvia was doing, talking to other people that maybe you have a small group of friends at work that you feel comfortable sharing your salary. I actually saw a post the other day I thought was a good, per se asking people about their salaries if you if you are let's say getting promoted to a senior project manager position and there is someone in your firm that in that position right now um, the post the article is reading was suggesting you to approach that person that's already in that position and ask them if they feel comfortable sharing their salary because you just got promoted. You want to make sure that your own salary is matching what the company is paying other senior managers. Um, I don't know if that person will feel comfortable telling you, but I thought that was a good way to, to like put yourself in the map of the company on like how much they're paying different positions. Um, to just have this conversation is really important. And I also think if you are asking for a raise and you're not getting it, by all means, just switch to a different company <laughs> because there's, right, especially right now, there's so many people hiring that is a great time to switch job if you want to. Um, I personally, at Gensler have been very fortunate that I was getting a very good raise every single year with bonuses. So I didn't feel the need to switch job. And it's also, it's a great way to um, retain your people to give them raises because if you can't match the market raise, people are just gonna leave. And, you know, I, loved where I was working so I didn't want to leave so in order for me not to leave they have to match my salary every year so I think this is definitely an important topic and instead of just you know doing the switching job and all that stuff is thinking about how you can in your own firm grow um, and have that have that salary increase yeah. One thing that um, I learned along the way that I wish I knew earlier is kind of just like what schedule does your firm, if there is a structure for how they promote and give raises and promotions, like understand that because I think a lot of people are like, I'll wait till my uh, one year review or like my, uh, like my annual review or semi-annual review to talk about it. But by then they already know who they're promoting for that year. So like you might actually be skipping, like you might have to wait till the next cycle to do so. So just like understand what are the qualifications to, that they, like you must be licensed for to get to an associate level. Like if you don't know that, like you're already at a disadvantage because then you don't know how they're evaluating. And then also to really put yourself out there, I think Joanne, I saw this through one of your posts that you shared once or somewhere I saw it that you said that like you market or like you have your brand because after that you didn't have to ask for promotions anywhere uh, anymore because your information was already clear like what your accomplishments were. 
Um, so I think that's a great way to think about it. Like, you don't want to be like, hey, give me a promotion, like I'm worth it. But if you already have highlighted, like all the things that you have done, and it's very apparent, then you'll already be on their mind when they're, when they discuss who's like up for raises and promotions. And I really appreciate that way. It's not just like self promotion, because you think you're amazing, you should think you're amazing. But that's not what you're sharing. You're sharing like the hard work you've done. And that's not always apparent. And especially like, maybe your boss sees it, maybe not like, they'll probably know that you have a good work ethic. Do they know all the points that you've, like how deeply you care about this and all the work and things that you've added to the project? They may not. And then does their boss know like who makes these promotions? So really like highlight your um, your accomplishments. Uh, I've updated my resume through the years just because I would see a job that was really interesting to me that I wanted to go to, not just for like higher pay or anything, just because I thought the, um, that role was would be like something I'm, that would really um, I would something I want to do, and because of that, I had to um, update my resume. But then I also have to evaluate myself and see like, oh yeah, I did do that. Like this is what I um, added to the project. So I think that gave helped my self confidence along the way because I was always like reflecting on my projects for the resume purpose. But then it made me more confident to like think that I deserve like the pay that I felt that my work was worth. Yeah, I'm I think kind of like, sorry, <laughs> kind of like, like you said, so like in marketing, we're always talking about how can we keep ourselves as top of mind for our customers, right? So whenever they are ready to buy our product, we are the, the top of mind. And it's the same as in your career, how do you market yourself and build your personal brand <laughs> in a way that it you're always on top of their mind. And when it comes to conversations about promotions, about races that you are already like at the top of the list. And it seems like a very selfish way to look at things, but it's, it's a very, you have to treat your career very strategically. Like, like last time we talked about treat your career like a business where you are branding yourself as this package that you're always there and basically shove it on the face that this is all the accomplishment you have done. And like Sylvia mentioned, ever since I built my personal brand, I never had to ask for a raise. And I was always given raises that is way above what um like the market normal race would get because I was always there basically selling myself but not in like a salesy way I'm just you know joining communities hosting events doing things that, so they know that I have a voice in this industry and that my opinions are valuable and people outside of the firm also values my opinion and it gives you more like a lick up in the in the races and promotion game that that is so critical what you just said i think like um you know we've talked that thing about the past about the how architects inherently uh hate marketing in general, right? There's just, I mean, it's it was written in the code of ethics back in the early 1900s. It's like core to the, and, and even that didn't get revised until like the seventies, right? So you have a whole generation of people that don't like marketing and which is probably symptomatic or probably the cause, the root causes to a lot of the industry's problems today. But, you know, we live in a time now where building audiences is really critical to not just company success, but also personal success. And this idea of how can you ensure, uh, there's one way to look at this, like how do, you, how do you increase the surface area of your luck, right? It's by being as in, in as many different places as possible where people can discover who you are, what kind of work you do and all this. And that can be as a firm owner, all the way to just as a personal individual who's trying to move up in an industry. And all the mechanics that Joanne described are, you know, th they're ways of reframing yourself and positioning yourself within 
a firm, right? So they stop like at some point, this all breaks down to the different sizes of the firm, right? There's this really small firm. It's kind of a little bit different, a large firm, you know, where let's say there's already operations really well in place and they're really looking long, long view because smaller firms struggle with being able to see two years out. Right. As you get larger, when you're a very large firm, like the size of Glenn Gensler, you're trying to see five years out. And so your team and who you keep on your team end up being very critical to that, like long view um, often. And so this is one of those ways in which you can sort of stand out. Um, now, I, I do think that there's also a component to that, which um, it's kind of like, how can you use, like, what are the, the ways in which you can distribute your own, like, let people know what you're doing. I, I remember like in, at, at WeWork, um, there's a, there's a Slack, there's a Slack group at WeWork and there's a Slack group here at Monograph. And oftentimes I think there's like an 80, eight, the Pareto rule of 80, 20 applies. And so the most notable people were always commenting in like the most public channels. And there was always like a handful of them, but they, you always kind of knew who you, who they were. And it's not to say that like that's that that's just an example of like one form of marketing yourself. It's like being active and engaged in the places where most people can kind of see what you're doing so that they know who you are ultimately. And it because it's it's very hard. You can get easily lost in the shuffle, especially in the in an industry where there's not like the org chart doesn't necessarily support a much clearer system of progressing through, right? Like in other words. Joanne, I know from your experience, you've had only recent up until like towards the later uh, years of your time at Gensler, they started to include people that were kind of like advocates for you. But no one, almost no one has a direct manager in large firms, right? That's actually cares about your career growth. Oftentimes that's, it. you need these other systems. You need to kind of play in these other kind of circles to be able to get your uh, to be able to stand out because no one's advocating for you. I'm curious if if any of that changed for you, Joanne, once you had an advocate. Yeah, definitely. Like, I think once you have an advocate, it's it's, it's much easier to be in those like promotion conversations that there's like a director level person that are advocating for you. But also throughout the year, like my, I guess, my mentor <laughs> would keep like pushing me to do different things. Like she would push me to go present to the group of design directors. So your face are seen by this group of people that are making decision on in the future who becomes a design director. Um, she would push me to do client presentations every single time we have a client presentation. Um, but it it's kind of like this it's kind of like on a one-on-one level I think it's important to have an advocate because she hasn't has the experience in the firm to know what steps you need to take to get to where you want to go um so I think you know it's it's good to have an advocate where she is in the position where you want to be in and eventually she can guide you through like especially in a large firm, this very complex structure (laughs) to get promoted um, to where you want to be. So yeah, I think it's definitely important to have those like one-on-one conversations. And again, we always talk about having more one-on-one instead of just keeping the annual review system that most architecture firms do. I also want to add that when you were talking about the Slack group that I had this conversation with my boss like Gensler once where he he said in a large firm you only really need to be known for just one thing and then people will remember you so he gave me an example what he was known for was years and years ago when Bluebeam first started he was really into Bluebeam so he decided to make a stamp, you know, the stamp on Bluebeam where stamping submittals. It's so old school, you have like an actual stamp, you stamp on the drawings. 
so because he was he really was fascinated by blue beam he started making a stand for the firm um and that stand that he made ended up being used in the entire Gensler and he was known as the person that made that stamp and that put him on the map and that put him like everyone knew him and it started becoming this thing and and he was talking about how you don't need to have this grand like you know this entire career path plan out you just need to be known for one thing some people was known for their rapid skills and they become like a rapid leader in the firm some people were known for um being really good with understanding building codes so they're like the building code te technical person and i think when you're in a large it's different in a small firm but when you're in a large firm being just known for one thing is much easier um to to help your career well, one one last thing that I, I like to talk about too is like negotiations. There's a really great book uh, by this uh, former like the ne negotiations expert for like either the FBI, you know, uh, Chris Voss uh, for hostage situations. And the book is called Never Split the Difference. And he talks about how he teaches their tech techniques and strategies and how to negotiate more effectively. And I think these are reading that book and then as a, if you work at a small firm, you know, ultimately like people have different object, uh, objectives, right? Like the firm owner might have an object, depending on like their, their ability to bring in work, they might feel conflicted. And let's say they, they're not very business savvy. They might feel conflicted as to how to pay people because they don't understand necessarily the impact of like paying someone a certain amount in which to, so they can live. Uh, and then how that can like actually impact the business. So when you're in that position, thinking about what 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 is what is the person that's offering that can potentially raise my salary? What what are the concerns that they have, right? And trying to understand what are the challenges that they that they're what are the pressures that they have? What are the things that they're trying to overcome? And how can you develop beyond? Like different ways of approaching even a compensation conversation, as, as an example. Um, it could be that you inherently are actually pretty good at networking mm -hmm. and you find that the, that, uh, the firm owner or whatever is not necessarily very good. There's conversation you can have where like, okay, like I want to increase the base salary, but I want to help you bring in more work to the firm, but I want to make sure that I get a percentage out of every single deal that I bring into the firm. As an example, on the marketing team, we have a sales team, right? And that team is comped very differently than all other team members. They have a base salary of a certain percentage. Let's say if it's 100%, I, I'm not explicit with the numbers, but let's say it's like 70% of that is salary, 30% of that is um, they can make from sales, right? So that's like their bonus or their, their comp structure is based on that. That doesn't exist as much in architecture and it should, right? Like if you work in business development, it would make total sense that if you're bringing deals into the company that you get a percentage of that deal or at a certain level uh, for the business. And so up taking, taking stock of where you sit strategically within a firm and moving beyond maybe your own role, trying to align objectives with the company as a whole could be a way for you to renegotiate your position or you can say like okay you won't give me more salary well i want to take more time off right or there's always a lever you can pull in a negotiation that doesn't just straight up mean salary and so you need to just understand where that fits for you and what you can contribute right it could be like well maybe we can install a bonus truck you know whatever that means right but i i i, I would leave everyone with the thought that you can actually be much more nimble or more strategic with how you plan a, com a compensation conversation. And don't be afraid for these conversations either. Like it might be weird the first time, but then, you know, it's just practice. You'll get used to it. And like, it's, it's something that's valuable for you to kind of get used to, get comfortable with. And, and if you can advocate for yourself, how can you advocate for, even, even when you decide to start your own firm, let's say, how will you be able to advocate for your business when you're in front of clients, right? 
so these these tactics and strategies like that book never split the difference really really helpful that you could apply to almost any scenario it doesn't even it could be like even if you have kids and you're a parent it could be how you negotiate there's even a little bit of that uh and if you don't have time for a book there's also a master class uh that he provides in um uh, masterclass.com that he it's really amazing i suggest you watch it it's phenomenal so anyway uh with that um time our time is up for today thanks everyone for joining us um and uh we're always here every every tuesday next week we'll be talking about imposter syndrome please invite more of your friends to come along don't be shy or or uh you know feel free to jump in on any conversation that we have i know a lot of you listen to us while you're at the office if you want to sneak into a conference room and ask your questions there, feel free or just drop them into the chat and we'll pick them up next time. So uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you to the team here, Joanne, Sylvia, for joining us as well. Thank you. Thank you. See you Cheers. next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.